Before I go into tonight's presentation on occultism as philosophy, I want to share with you a very personal story of something that happened to me today, this very, very morning. And I think within this story, uh, some of you will be able to recognize your own experiences, maybe experiences, in fact, that have proven very common to you. I had what might be called a, a minor episode of occult insight, arguably, arguably, um, insight that seemed to come from someplace other than pure chance or logic or deduction. And I want to share with you exactly what happened and the conflicting feelings that it, it brought to bear for me as a seeker, as a searcher. I define myself, as many of you know, as a believing historian. I participate in many of the uh, movements that I write about. And I think that can really be a strength for the historian, especially if he or she is transparent about it, because when you're involved in something, when you really have skin in the game, I think it can be a help in realizing the ideals and also the failings, the shortfalls, the questions that surround certain movements and practices. Now, I personally uh, am interested in tarot cards. I'm interested in the history of tarot as it emerged from the Middle Ages. I'm interested in the images of tarot as they're suggestive of different aspects of the Western esoteric tradition, uh, Hermeticism in particular, which was an amalgam of Greek Egyptian philosophy and late antiquity, and the imagery, frankly, that you found within Middle Ages Christianity, uh, within passion plays at carnivals on stained glass windows. Uh, I'm also interested in tarot's possibilities as a divinatory tool. Uh, as much as I take a very deep historical interest in tarot, and I, I really labor to separate the actual from the imaginary in tarot's history, I will never once discount the mystical allegory that plays out within the cards and the possibility that the cards contain divinatory potentials. Now, I'm going to justify that, and I'm going to say another word about that, but I do want to mention that there was a period of time in my life, not long ago, where I was publicly reading tarot cards for people. As I grew interested in tarot several years ago, there was one weekend, and this may or may, not, may or may not have been a wise decision on my part, but there was one weekend I think it was it was over a holiday weekend. It may have been Labor Day or Memorial Day. Some of you may have even been part of this, where I went on Facebook, a place I, I no longer uh, participate in, but where I went on Facebook and I offered free tarot readings to anybody who asked. And uh, I was in a rather jovial mood. I was celebrating this mini documentary that I had just completed with the New Age streaming network Gaia on tarot. I thought it was a, a well done uh, documentary. And in celebration and, and in a leap of enthusiasm and in wishing to hone my own skills, I offered free tarot readings to anyone. And I was flooded with requests. And I must have done literally hundreds of tarot readings over the course of 72 hours. My particular method for tarot readings is a three card spread. I randomly pick three cards and essentially I look within that three card spread for a story almost as if I'm looking at a comic strip sometimes I may detect a linear story other times I may get a spread that I'll call wings where the central card in the middle is affected and reflected by the cards on either side of it this was a particular spread that I learned from the artist Robert M. Place, who has a very good book called The Tarot, and I've practiced it for many years. Now, of the hundreds of people to whom I gave readings on that holiday weekend, many, many people contacted me anecdotally to say that the readings were spot on and that they were very, very happy. 
And I had heard um, from a lot of people that way. Now, there may also have been people who were unhappy and had contrary viewpoints, which I want to hear, but I, I didn't hear any. And I've always gotten very good feedback. And for a little while, I started reading the cards for a very modest fee. And then the fee creeped up a little bit. And I felt like I was doing good work, but I didn't like it somehow. I felt as though my own questions around tarot were insufficiently settled to be offering readings to the public, to be offering readings professionally. It was not a role with which I was fully ethically comfortable. I'm not down on it in any way. I'm just relating this as my experience. So I stopped. At the beginning of COVID, I did free readings for any kind of caregivers, docs, nurses, healthcare professionals who were under so much stress. But beyond that, I stopped. And I, I read the cards from time to time for myself, for friends, for people I love. And I've always been dogged by these questions of the actuality of the foresight that can be derived from tarot. I have my own theory about why tarot may actually be authentically useful as a tool, not only of psychological insight, but I would even go so far as to say of metaphysical or extra physical insight as a divinatory tool. And I can explain and justify that, and I will get to that. And I write about it in some of my books, including most recently, Daydream Believer. I dedicate a whole chapter to it. So I take this seriously, and I think about it seriously. Now, dig this. This was the episode that happened to me today. Okay, I make my living by writing and speaking. That's what I do. And um, I love every minute of it, but there can be some uncertainty in it as a livelihood. And I'm faced presently in the here and now with two business arrangements, two business offers, basically. And I did readings on each of these two uh, business offers, both of which are important to me. And one reading came up uh, a bust. You know, it it, 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 the reading suggested deep unhappiness. Okay. Another reading for the other venture came up very successfully, suggested everything is uh, going to go like gangbusters. And for probably two weeks, I've walked around with discomfort with these readings because they struck me as inaccurate. The, 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 the reading that was negative surrounded a job, a set of circumstances that up to this particular point has worked out just fine, has worked out really, really well. The reading that was positive, that was very encouraging, actually uh, pertains to a job, uh, a commission that up to this point has been very fraught and fitful and filled with questions that I've even been tempted to walk away from at certain points. And I said to myself, you got to be disciplined. You got to abide these readings because it's too sloppy. It's too lazy. It's too inexact just to go back and pose the same question again because the answer didn't seem right or I don't like the answer. What could be more fickle? What could be more immature? What could be more soft-headed? But as time passed, I felt to myself this confusion, it was really eating at me because these, these spreads that I did seemed almost diametrically opposite of what I was experiencing in real time. So I said, you know what, for this instance, I'm going to throw caution to the wind and I'm going to go back and I'm going to repeat these readings just to see what the hell happens. Now, these are three card spreads. So these are not complex spreads. They're simple as can be. It doesn't get any simpler unless you're drawing a single card. In each of the two consecutive readings, would you believe, and I'm going to show it to you right here, the pivotal cards that I pulled weeks apart with total shuffling of the deck, totally in private, 
the pivotal cards that I pulled were exactly the same. This was the positive reading. This was obviously the negative reading. They were exactly the same. The chances of pulling the same cards out of a 78-card deck, these are obviously from the Waite Smith deck, weeks apart, shuffling the deck, asking the same questions in consecutive order, and in both cases, getting exactly the same pulls with respect to the pivotal cards in the spread, they're so low, I don't even know that they're realistically calculable. I could sit down with a couple of statisticians and we could talk it out and we would have to have a very hardcore theoretical discussion about how many variables to include in order to even come up with these astronomical circumstances which approach mathematical impossibility. Is this evidence of some kind of occult operation? No, I don't really see it as such. It's testimony. Testimony over time, as I often say, can assemble into a record, and that record can function as evidence. Is it just mundane chance? Well, fantastic things do occur. In this case, perhaps it would be more fantastic <laughs> that I would beat the odds just by random than I would come up with some sort of a psychological uh, hit. But yes, it's possible that it was mundane. But boy, it threw me back on my heels. I'm not a stranger to stats. I'm not a stranger to crunching very, very tough, astronomically small stats because I'm interested in ESP research, parapsychology research, and in that field, among others in the social sciences, you have to deal with chances and stats so that you can demonstrate that when somebody beats random odds, the likelihood of it being just by chance, especially when things repeat over the course of a session, let's say, testing for some extra sensory, capa extra sensory capability. The chances of repeat hits in well-structured circumstances are effectively impossible. Not impossible, but effectively impossible. They're so low. And I was struck by this episode and I wanted to share it up top because although the topic of tonight's presentation and the exchange that will follow is occultism as philosophy, there is a hands-on quality to the occult search. And I wanted to share with you one aspect of that hands-on quality, which is suggestive, which is suggestive in the aggregate, not any one circumstance or maybe even a thousand such circumstances, but in the aggregate of the human experience, I think it's suggestive of our capacity to self-experiment and possibly participate in some extra physical quality of the psyche, which I firmly believe exists. Now, my definition of philosophy, it's easy enough to tear apart the word etymologically and love of wisdom, but my my definition of philosophy as a practice is the study of first causes, the study of first causes. There are as many different definitions of philosophy as there are branches of philosophy, but it seems to me that that study of first causes allows philosophy to be brought into myriad, myriad fields, um, psychology, metaphysics, ethics, natural sciences, engineering, mathematics, so forth and so on. Philosophy as a study of first causes is applicable throughout the human situation, either on a very intimate scale, a person can speak very legitimately of having a, a personal philosophy, or on a, a, a macro scale. We, 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 have a, we might have a philosophy of physics that helps us organize and evaluate some of the ideas that grow out of quantum theory, a philosophy of, of mathematics, the questions of, of whether calculation is uh, knows any limits, for example, uh, a philosophy of um, space-time. Is there any difference between space-time? Is there any difference between distance and an interval of time? We use these references uh, 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 in a colloquial way 
to mean different things. Time passes intervals, distance passes is 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 the space between one point and another. But are they are they actually different? Because in conditions that we regard as extreme, such as uh, an object moving at or near light speed, time space uh, collapses into one phenomena because an object is moving so quickly that it actually eliminates some of the experienced distance between two points. So this is what philosophy does. We look for first causes. I'm reminded of something funny where a mentor of mine uh, whose work some of you know, the philosopher Jacob Needleman, uh, who died just a little over one year ago, uh, when he was a kid, he was first studying pre-med, and he decided he wanted to switch his major from pre-med to philosophy. And so he had to tell his parents back home in Philadelphia, and um, his father asked him, what does a philosopher do? And Jerry said, uh, well, a philosopher is someone who asks, uh, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? And his dad said, uh, can't you be a banker and do that too? Which I thought was not a bad point. Um, but this is what philosophy is to me. It's the study of first principles. And occultism, occultism uh, is a term that really came into usage in some respects in, in the modern era. Uh, the term occult first appeared in the Oxford English Dictionary in 1545. Uh, it grew to some degree of prominence uh, during uh, the Renaissance, where Renaissance scholars, translators, clerics, royals, educated people who were few, were rediscovering some of the lost philosophies, lost religious ideas of the ancient world, Persia, Greece, Egypt, Rome. They were re-encountering spiritual expressions in myth, story, spell work, outlook, ideals, deity worship. They were re-encountering ideas that had banished from public view for centuries upon centuries with the advent of Christianity beginning in the early to mid uh, 300s AD in the Roman Empire and with the eventual uh, adoption of Christianity or a variant of it. It's undergone so many changes and permutations, but with the adoption of Christianity as the state religion of Rome and it spread throughout Europe, Persia, the Mediterranean, North Africa. With the advent of Christianity, the antique religious forms that had animated the lives of millions of men and women from Egypt to Polynesia to Siberia, vanished from public view. Anywhere the Roman Empire's footprint was felt, anywhere the armies of uh, the Greek conqueror Alexander the Great had once tread, um, gave way either to dominant Christianity or later in antiquity to Islam, with obviously some pockets of Judaism, some pockets of other faiths, uh, Yazidism, Zoroastrianism, um, uh, obviously, there were other faiths going on in different parts of the world, the Vedic traditions, the Buddhist traditions, Confucianism, animism, Taoism. But within what I classify as the West, which, again, was pretty much any place the Greek armies of Alexander had spread, and they spread very far and wide from, I mean, literally from North Africa up through Western and, and, and parts of Eastern Europe, um, that's what I would classify as the West, historically speaking. These old traditions were squelched out. They were vanished. They were destroyed. Their books, their ideas, those that survived the fires of um, waves and waves of change, sometimes warfare, forcible conversion, uh, crusader warfare, inquisitions, those documents that had survived maybe were secreted away into monasteries, a few surviving schools, some were buried, 
And for various reasons, antique manuscripts uh, that seem to have existed somewhere in the eastern reaches of the Roman Empire came to attention uh, in the court of Cosimo de' Medici, who was the Florentine Renaissance era uh, leader uh, and promoter of so many ideas in the arts and culture from his royal court in Florence. And around the year 1462, a Byzantine monk entered his court with manuscripts that were signed by the mythical figure of Hermes Trismegistus, or thrice greatest Hermes, a name of honor that the ancient Greeks at one time had given to Greeks, to Egypt's god of writing and intellect, Thoth an ibis-headed god who was often pictured in profile holding a writing stylus in his hand, a humanoid, a humanoid body, and the head of an ibis, a water bird, which was venerated by the Egyptians as a being that could traverse the elements of reality, water, water air, earth, fire. So the ancient Greeks gave, bestowed this appellation of honor, three times greatest Hermes or thrice greatest Hermes upon Thoth. And these ancient manuscripts that were discovered, late ancient manuscripts that were written in the decades probably immediately following the deaths of Cleopatra and, and Christ, these manuscripts posited an ancient philosophy whereby your psyche, the human psyche, is not only possessed of immortality, but it can free itself through meditation, prayer, physical preparation from the bonds of physicality. And that the individual, through the growth and the expansion of his or her psyche, becomes not only equal to the gods, but in fact, greater than the gods. Humanity within the hermetic scheme within these manuscripts I'm describing to you, which are the tiniest fragment of esoteric thought that had existed in Egypt for literally millennia. It's hard to conceive of these, these timelines. Within the folds of this way of thought was this notion, as I was referencing, that you, the individual, are actually greater than the gods because the gods are fixed in immortality but you, the individual, so went the hermetic outlook, are in the process of becoming. As you learn the expansion of your mind, as you learn that the imagination through its mental pictures actually creates reality as above, so below at the great hermetic dictum found in a manuscript called the Emerald Tablet, but it's found in different wording throughout other ancient hermetic works, as above, so below. As you were created by a great you know, unseen infinite mind, sometimes referred to as nous, a Greek word for a, an infinite mind or infinite state of being, so can you create within your framework of existence. But you must also suffer the limitations of that framework of existence, which include mortality and death. We always make this decision as human beings today that implicitly, perhaps, that we're at the top of the evolutionary ladder without ever considering that there may be a ladder that stretches infinitely beyond anything that we see. And we may be, we may be, as was theorized by the great esoteric teacher G.I. Gurji, we may be actually at a very disadvantageous place in the scheme of creation, which the Hermeticists saw as consisting not of a ladder, not of a hierarchical ladder, a very Western concept, but that wasn't how our ancestors exactly viewed it, but rather as concentric circles, ex expanding concentric circles of reality. We may be very, very far from the center of that circle where dwells, one might say, noose, this great infinite mind. We may be very far from that. So while we in potential, possess these extraordinary powers, we also have to deal with very sharp physical limitations and suffering and death. But these powers in their potentiality are no less real because of it, because of this disadvantageous 
physical position in which we find ourselves. But within Hermeticism, there's no morbidity about this. Again, the notion is that the individual is in the process of becoming. Now, Renaissance thinkers and scholars, in addition to being thrilled by this material, were trying to figure out how to classify it, what to call it. And they settled upon uh, a Latin term, uh, occulta, or occulta, meaning hidden or concealed. And they, of course, viewed this material as the secret of secrets, what Madame H. P. Blavatsky referred to as the secret doctrine, or what Renaissance scholars sometimes referenced in Latin as a prisca theologia, a primeval theology, something that was older than everything else, something that formed the foundation of all of humanity's modern faiths. So again, uh, Renaissance scholars were wrestling with how to classify this, and they used the word occulta, which then later became our English term, occult. And that's why I continue to use the term occult today, along with many others, that sometimes rub people the wrong way, because culturally, occultism is an outsider spirituality. It belongs to no particular religion, sect, or congregation. And what happens to people who don't belong to some big consortium or gang that's going to look out for them? Well, they get blamed for things. They get shoved around. They get pushed to the margins. And occultism, since its emergence uh, as a rediscovered, readapted, reclaimed ancient spirituality encompassing alchemy, Kabbalah, astrology, divination, prophecy, number symbolism, deity worship, deity veneration, deity petition. All these facets of ancient spirituality came to be somewhat reclaimed, reborn, reconstituted, reconstructed under the rubric of the modern term occult. Occultism is a modern resounding of the fragments of the spiritual practices of the ancients, our ancient ancestors. And when I say spiritual, I mean simply this, extra physical. Spirituality, for me, is just a term for extra physicality. I get into a habit, and probably many of you get into a habit, of using terms like occult and esoteric interchangeably. And I don't like to get too hung up on terminology because the simple fact is, if we don't speak in generalities, we're unable to communicate. So I, I, I think there's a debt that, that I owe to speaking in generality sometimes, because again, if we don't, we fail to communicate at all. But it is important uh, uh, to point out that I believe there is a real difference between occultism and, and esotericism. The two concepts are not at odds, but there is a difference uh, between them. It seems to me that the occult, as I've referenced, is a term that we have inherited, that we're welcome to use or not use um, from this era of the Renaissance I'm describing. And the occult refers to religious forms that are outside of any of the dominant Abrahamic or Judeo-Christian forms that grew rife here in the West. Occultism is, in fact, a, it's a Western philosophy for the simple reason that we who live in the West, and again, that's a broad definition extending from North Africa through uh, North America, Western Eastern Europe, any place where the footsteps of Alexander's armies landed or any place that was either a colonial or migratory offshoot of those territories is, I think, defensively considered the West. Okay, There are religious traditions in the East that are uninterrupted. I mentioned several of them, Hinduism or the Vedic tradition, Buddhism, which grew out of Vedism, of course, 
um, Confucianism, Taoism, animism, shamanism. There are all kinds of primeval belief systems that have been practiced in varying forms for literally millennia. So if you, let's say, grow up in Mumbai and you grow up in a Hindu family and you consider yourself a part of the Hindu faith, you have roots that go back, maybe not uninterrupted, but that go back thousands of years. It's really quite remarkable. Our situation here in the West is not the same. We experienced a schism, a rupture. The Abrahamic religions, by which I mean Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the monotheistic faiths of Christianity and Islam in particular, swept through these territories where Alexander and later the Roman Empire had been dominant, and they changed the religious and cultural landscape dramatically. Nothing ever disappears. You find aspects of ancient folkloric and pagan uh, worship incorporated within Christianity down to the very particulars of its calendar. You find aspects of that, I would suggest less so, uh, within Islam. But these faiths uh, swept through uh, the, 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 the territories where, again, Egypt, Persia, Greece, Rome, where vastly differing seasonally-based, nature-based, polytheistic faiths held sway for thousands upon thousands of years. The architecture, the education, the belief system, the mathematics, astronomy, astrology, calendrics, farming, hunting, everything was sacralized and combined with mystery traditions, esoteric traditions, initiatory traditions, polytheistic systems, divinatory systems that, that populated these worlds. And those systems as formal religious structures were wiped out, were wiped out. So we in the West have this kind of schismatic historical personality, in which sense I would say occultism is specifically uh, a Western philosophy. Everybody and anybody can participate in it. I'm speaking in terms of the geography from where it sprang. Esotericism is somewhat different. Esotericism uh, comes from the Greek word um, esotericois, meaning inner. And esotericism, which has related concerns to occultism, really deals with the inner core of religion. So you can be a Christian esotericist. You can, you can be involved with um, Muslim esotericism, sometimes called Sufism. Uh, you can be involved with Jewish esotericism or K Kabbalah. There's all kinds of different expressions of esotericism. The religions of the East, Vedas, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, so forth. They have esoteric sides. The, the esoteric side is concerned with the inner core, the mystical core of a religious inquiry where perhaps there are no forms of mediation between you, the individual, and your attempt to reach out to some sort of a higher principle. So occultism and esotericism have shared concerns and are by no means at odds, but they are different. Occultism is really outside the gates. It's an outsider philosophy, and it's been treated like an outsider philosophy for hundreds of hundreds of years. It suits me because I'm not much of a, how can I put it? I'm not much of a joiner. Um, I'm a member of the Theosophical Society, and I'm very proud to be because, among many other things, the the Theosophical Society fosters the study of all these different faiths and facilitates the exchange through meetings exactly like this one. And if you want to promote and preserve that kind of thing, I encourage people to become members of the Theosophical Society. But beyond that, I'm pretty much a lone wolf. I'm not really congregational in orientation. Um, I was for certain periods of my life, but as I got older, I found that my search was a solitary one. Although 
the exchange has an important place in it uh, before this evening is over. We all are going to have a chance to have an exchange. I've gone through periods where I've been part of groups, and I value those periods enormously, but they're not part of my life right now. For me, the occult search, occultism itself, is classifiable as a philosophy because it, it participates in the search for first principles from the perspective, the warranted perspective, I would argue, the warranted belief, I would argue, that there is an extra physical capacity to human life. I use the term psyche. A 19th century writer might have used the term soul. But if we're talking about an extra physical capacity within the individual, maybe we're talking about something along the same line, something similar, something that intersects. I've said that I believe the search for extra physicality, the perspective that extra physicality is actual, is real, is a, is a warranted belief. It's a warranted belief from several different viewpoints. For one thing, uh, it has animated the life and ideas of extraordinary individuals across millennia, from Lao Tzu to Christ to Proust to Sylvia Plath uh, to you name it. Thousands of our most profound, memorable thinkers within the, the human situation, thinkers whose work attained posterity have abided the spiritual search, the search for extra physicality, the belief that extra physicality is not only legitimate, but shows itself in ethics, experience, conduct, right living. And countless men and women, countless men and women, including many of you, who are participating in this session this evening have had similar such experiences and have spoken about those experiences, written down those experiences, recorded those experiences. And as I said earlier, testimony forms a record. Testimony forms a record. Before we used to attach electrodes to the brains of meditators and discover what was occurring in the brain during the meditative process, of all different kinds, um, from all different traditions, we had thousands of years of testimony that made it clear that meditation was critically important as a spiritual and therapeutic tool. Now, of course, living in the modern era, some of these things are actually testable. And the tests done in a scientific setting like in a clinical laboratory testing for the presence of uh, ESP or telepathy or precognition. And there are, are reams of such material uh, tests in under the rubric of parapsychology that present us with absolutely bulletproof, replicable evidence for a non-physical exchange of information, again, in a lab setting, repeatable, uncorrupted data, tested meta-analyzed data, pooled data, show us again and again and again that we have absolutely concrete, world-class scientific evidence for ESP clairvoyance precognition. Doesn't mean this stuff is going on all the time, and it doesn't mean this stuff can be fit to order, like flicking on a light switch or turning on a water faucet but it is as real as the words I'm speaking to you right now. The evidence is there. As I like to say, if you read Wikipedia, you have good reason to doubt me. We're in a terrible situation right now in Wikipedia. Wonderful, wonderful information resource, but a crowdsourced resource. And there have been crowdsourcing zealots who dispute the very things that I'm saying to you right now, people who come from a perspective of, hardcore physicalism or hardcore materialism, whereas they believe that all of life simply boils down to chemical processes and nothing exists beyond what's been mapped out on the, the, the table of chemical elements 
and that any talk of extra physicality, non-local intelligence is, is fantasy. That viewpoint in, in, in ways that I think are intellectually very shoddy, very slippery, and very sentimental, very ideologically driv driven, holds sway on Wikipedia. Very important information resource. Um, and it's a problem. It's a problem. Makes it difficult for students, for journalists, for curious people to look into what I'm saying, which is why I dedicate large sections of my books, recent books, Daydream Believer, uh, Modern Occultism, my most recent book, Uncertain Places, another book I published recently. I dedicate significant sections to writing about the evidence for parapsychology, and I back up that evidence with meticulously structured footnotes that I include not at the end of chapters or at the end of the book, but on the page itself, because I want people, both both those who are critical of my position, those who share my position, to look at those footnotes and call me out if I am exaggerating anything. Because this material, this parapsychological material that speaks to the extra physical capacity of the psyche, that tests and produces actual evidence of the extra physical transfer of information in laboratory settings, a transfer, by the way, that is unbound by time, space, distance, mass. It's absolutely extraordinary material. The news of that material, the validity of that material, the reality of that material, um, it hits barriers. It hits barriers because Modernist intellectual culture in journalism and academia and now on Wikipedia um, tends to be very materialistic, very physicalistic in its orientation, tends for cultural reasons to be hostile to um, religion in general, to see religion as something that belonged to the ancient regime and the new rationalist regime is one in which we don't depend upon mysteries or initiations or wizards hiding behind the curtain or, you know, lunatics pulling tarot cards and things of that nature. But they're wrong. They're wrong. The critics are wrong for the simple reason that science is methodological replication. That's what it is. It's methodological replication, and it's extremely important, and it has brought us wonderful things. But you can't flip over the chessboard if you don't like where the pieces are being moved. I'm not entitled to flip over the chessboard if the so-called game is going against me. And if I can demonstrate by methodological replication that an individual gets a better score on a test when he or she studies after the test is done, after the test is done. This is sometimes called retrocausality. It calls into question the cognitive reality of time itself. If that can be proven through ironclad studies, which it has been at Cornell University now going back about 11 or 12 years. And if that can be replicated in meta-analysis, which it has been through 90 trials at 33 different labs in 14 different nations, if that data can be proved confirmatory through meta-analysis, that's science itself. That's science itself. That's the name of the game. To say, oh, gee, I don't accept that because it, it violates all common observation. Oh, gee, I don't accept that because, um, well, there's no theory behind it. There's no theory of deliverance. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to allow the absence of a theory. And there should be a theory. And I've worked on theories and I write about this in my books. There should be a theory. And, and, and the field of parapsychology needs a theory. Because it helps you. It helps you to classify ideas, bounce ideas around, throw out new things, incorporate new things, throw out old things, incorporate new things. Theory is, is useful. But I'm not going to deny uh, that, that, that the ocean has tides because there's not a theory of it. I'm not going to deny um, that an elephant has a trunk because there's not a theory of it. I mean, we get into a kind of 
Kafkaesque madness when we deny actual documented experience because there's no theory back of it or because, well, this messes up other paradigms that are important to us. Well, you know, tough. Reality is messy. And by the way, we have conflictual paradigms all the time within the, the Western scientific model. Quantum theory itself, which dictates in a nutshell, in a nutshell, that um, infinite possibilities are going on at once and we localize these things through perception and measurement. Quantum theory is not presently squared with Einstein's theory of relativity of time space, where the actual experience of time as a physically felt event gets interrupted in conditions of either extreme velocity or extreme gravity. That's been proven. That the Einstein's theories have been proven. Uh, quantum theory, it, it, some of the aspects of quantum theory, such as the existence of infinite possible outcomes, because reality only localizes upon selection, that hasn't been squared with Einstein's theories, but we abide both because the evidence is overwhelming. So is the evidence for the extra physicality of your psyche. And occultism as a search for metaphysical sources that is freed from the fealty to denomination, doctrine, religion that exists outside the gates has not only proven to be a historic impetus in the direction of men and women discovering the fullness of their psyches, the fullness of what it means to be a human being, but occultism as a philosophy encourages, in fact, one could even say requires individual experiments. Back to my tarot cards. I promised you that I was going to offer, okay, a theory, a possibility of why tarot may hold foresightful insights. Here it is. I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell. I write about it in greater detail in Daydream Believer, but I'm going to offer it up to you just in a peanut shell. Now, I want to go back for a minute to the uh, early to mid 20th century. Uh, Carl Jung and his circle of students were very interested in questions of whether certain devices had foresightful or divinatory qualities. Jung, in particular, was interested in the Chinese, the ancient Chinese oracle, the I Ching. The I Ching, as many of you know, is composed of 64 uh, hexagrams um, consisting of either solid or interrupted lines. And these hexagrams are, are characters, they're a language, uh, like classical Chinese is a language, like um, classical Egyptian hieroglyphs are a language, like classical uh, Hebrew characters are a language. These, these symbols, um, although they have phonetic counterparts, sometimes lost to time so that we're left to piece them together uh, in, a, in a patchwork way, but these symbols... Uh, all the symbols that I just mentioned, they have correlation to the natural elements, they have correlation to numbers, they have correlation to um, cosmic uh, events or, 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 or bodies, you know, touching on astronomy and astrology, and they have meanings as, as, as words, as concepts. It may be that the 64 hexagrams that make up the I Ching alphabet, the Book of Changes, uh, are the earliest alphabet actually known to, to humanity. There's, 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 there's good evidence for that. So Jung was very interested in the uses of the I Ching, the Book of Changes, as a divinatory device. And he and his circle of students studied it very long and hard, worked with it for some decades, and Jung came to feel that not only did the I Ching possess something that was uniquely insightful, but he came to feel that um, 
the device itself, the characterological alphabet itself, almost seemed to have a personality, almost seemed to have a certain character. And he, um, like me, and I'm sure like some of you, would sometimes ask the same question over and over. And he found that sometimes when he would do that, the I Ching would give him a kind of sardonic or even an insulting answer, as if to say, oh, you again, you're back with this problem. And he came to feel that uh, there was almost like a personality present. Now, he and some of his students theorized the following, and I think there's something there's something here, there's something here, and I apply it to tarot as another pictogrammatic device, okay? One could say the tarot cards in and of themselves are not exactly an alphabet as we know hieroglyphic or characterological alphabets, but just as each hexagram within the I Ching represents a picture of life, let's say a mountain or a mountain with water tumbling down it or uh, clouds or heavy clouds or clouds blocking the sun, so does the tarot deck psychologically have its own archetypal images and arguably language. Now, Jung and some of his students theorized that maybe, maybe when you do um, a throw of sticks or a throw of coins, your, your so-called random methodology, and you come up with uh, the uh, symbol um, that, that the uh, throw of sticks or the throw of coins um, dictates, which also is accompanied by another symbol, um, there are changing lines within the, the I Ching hexagram, and each each yin has a yang, you know, each black has a white. There's a kind of complementary uh, hexagram paired with, with whatever it is that you pick, because it's part of why it's called the Book of Changes. When you come up with your hexagrams, they theorize that maybe, maybe, you are, in a certain sense, capturing a kind of snapshot of reality at that instance, but a snapshot that's unbound by linear time. So what we're conditioned to think of as past, present, future might be contained within the rubric of that thing that you've selected. I look at tarot that way, and I will say this, I will say this, we know, we as a human species know that Linearity as we experience it, even though it's overwhelmingly persuasive and very likely necessary for so-called five sensory beings to navigate life, to get through life, um, we realize that linearity itself is an illusion, a necessary illusion an overwhelmingly persuasive illusion, but an illusion nonetheless. I mentioned Einstein's experiments earlier and their validation. Einstein theorized that when an object is moving at or near light speed, time as an actually physically felt experience slows down from the observer's perspective. So that, for example, the person in a spaceship moving at light speed will experience a stoppage or a slowing down of the aging process. Now, dig this, dig this. Our own astronauts today, even though they're obviously moving nowhere near the velocity of light speed, when they return to Earth, they demonstrate minute but demonstrable slowing of the aging process for the time that they were in space moving at extreme velocities. Again, nowhere near light speed. But, but astronauts right now in our time demonstrate minute but detectable slowing down of the aging process. This is real. This is real. This is no longer in the realm of theoretical physics. We know that this is so. Now, we also know that it is so, that when you're dealing with subatomic particles, and some particles that are larger than subatomic, it must be said, some that are larger than subatomic, but the classical experiments are that when you're dealing with subatomic particles and um, you direct these particles, let's say 
uh, photons, the infinitesimally smallest fragments of light at a targeting system, a double slit or something else, we know from interference patterns that these infinitesimal particles, these subatomic particles, are in a so-called wave state or state of superposition prior to measurement. They're everywhere at once. Only when the particle is measured does it settle in a, a, a localized measurable place. Only at the point of measurement does it become real. Measurement can be taken anytime by anyone, or it can be taken by an automatized device that's been set up, but no measurement, no actual real particle in one localized place. I know physicists who don't like that language because they feel like the point of quantum physics is not to speculate about the nature of reality or about the nature of consciousness or perception or attention and the formation of reality. It is there to, 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 to measure things. You do a square root of particles in a wave state and you're going to get uh, a location, which is extraordinary in itself. Why should that work? But the simple fact is no measurement, no location as a real physical fact. So, in the 1950s, um, a, phys a physicist named Hugh Everett III conceptualized what is called the many worlds theory. And the many worlds theory holds quite simply that all of reality is infinitely existent and becomes available to us, becomes tactile, palpable, palpable, actual, real within our framework of experience, at least on the subatomic scale, only when measurement is taken. Hence, it stands to reason that infinite events, infinite events are simultaneously playing out. And we don't realize this and see this because we have not, at that given moment, directed our attention to, taken measurement of, that potential actuality. But when we do take measurement, and again, I'm speaking on the subatomic scale, I'm speaking of classical quantum physics experiments. When we do take that measurement, the thing itself becomes real and tactile. But that doesn't mean all this other stuff isn't real. It doesn't mean that Had we taken the measurement a second later or a second earlier or not at all, that this stuff that enters our horizon line of actuality isn't real. Why, why would that be? Why would that be? Well, where'd all the other stuff go? It may still exist. It may still exist, but in different intersections of time that we don't experience normally. We might call these things different dimensions. And it could be, it could be that when you or I are doing a, a spread of, of, of tarot cards or using some pictogrammatic device or other, or using a, a device like the I Ching, which is a pictogrammatic and characterological device, maybe, maybe we're freeing ourselves from the bounds of conditioning for a moment and getting a glimpse of a, a kind of snapshot of reality that tells us what's going on. Maybe, in fact, those snapshots exist everywhere and all around us. We're just not conditioned to look that way or to think that way. Maybe when the ESP subject is seated in a laboratory and he or she is gleaning information that's not accessible through the five senses or any technology, maybe... Maybe that person gleans things um, from different intersections of time. Is it possible? Well, of course it's possible because we have evidence for it. Whether the theory that I'm venturing is viable, that's an open question. But we need to venture theory because, well, again, in the Western world, apparently evidence is not enough. Um there's probably a joke somewhere among physics graduate students that, you know, 
terrific evidence, but boy, you know, your theory is really lacking, so we can't accept it. You know, a theory is just a conceptual model of reality. It's not reality itself. What I'm describing is replicable reality. What I'm venturing is a theory as to why it happens. Occultism as a philosophy, as a spiritual philosophy, could be said to be an outlook that posits the existence of other dimensions, other intersections of time, possessed of their own beings, ideas, thoughts, and these things are felt on and through us. And the occult inquiry is the inquiry to locate practical means by which we, the individual, may be able to get in touch with and even find practical use from that extra reality, that ultra reality, that ultra reality that exists all around us. We experience things as singular, but we know that that's not the case because of part of what I've been describing. I won't go into the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment tonight, but I've written about that widely where Schrodinger made the case that you could conduct a quantum experiment where you would have to allow for the existence of a dead alive cat because you have to allow for the existence of multiple outcomes. I'm not going to march into that tonight. The fact is, it's a logical imperative, it seems to me, that we occupy a reality in which more is going on than we as five sensory beings are capable of taking in. So the occult search is 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 a spiritual search. It's a search that's based upon what I've referred to as the warranted belief in extra physicality, and it can cross over and intersect with these, these other fields that I'm talking about, neuroplasticity, mind-body medicine, uh, quantum theory, parapsychology, and most excitingly, in my mind, most excitingly, apropos of our present culture, the UFO thesis. And this is something that I've been writing about more and more, and I expect uh, to be diving into uh, more deeply in the in the months ahead. I'm very interested in the UFO thesis, as I think most people in our world are uh, today. Talk about evidence. You know, when I was a kid, the idea of having high def video, radar images, uh, security cam images from military bases of of unidentified objects, it was kind of hard to believe that these things would suddenly be available in a mass way, not to mention the enormous record of testimony uh, that we have from um, experiencers of all different kinds. And I'm hugely interested in this, uh, this thesis, but, but dig this, dig this. When you get down to those unexplained cases that let's say golden 5% or whatever it is of cases that really seem to elude any mundane explanation, I suppose you could you could say, well, maybe it's a super weapon that we don't know anything about. Okay, that's one category. Maybe it's extraterrestrial. Okay, most popular category. There's a third category, and there are many others beyond this, but I'm speaking in terms of where most people live. There's a third category that what's being experienced is, in fact, uh, interdimensional. Now, dig this. One of the barriers to the uh, ET explanation, the extraterrestrial explanation uh, for unexplained UFOs, is that the distances are so vast. The interstellar distances are so vast, it's difficult for us to conceive of any craft capable of traveling those distances in any any meaningful way. In other words, you could send a projectile out into space, but uh, what's the use if nobody's around to, to receive the data or the information that it encounters? Now, look, we have conceptual models of how um, a traveler might, ca might, might span unfathomable distances. We speak of cosmic wormholes where maybe you introduce some piece of exotic matter into space-time and you're able to collapse space-time in, in Einstein's conception and suddenly um, space-time is so collapsed that you're, you're leaping, in a sense, uh, distances that are, that are considered inconceivable. It's a model. It's a model. I would suggest that we actually have 
better models, better models, more fully worked through models of interdimensionality than we do of extraterrestriality. I've just been touching on some of them. Interdimensionality, it seems to me, apropos of the material that's come out of quantum physics and the endurance of the many worlds theory and the, the way over the past half century plus philosophers and students of physics have built upon the many worlds theory. It's a logical imperative that there are events that exist outside of our perceptual framework. And this is, to some extent, what string theory is about. String theory, a term that I'm sure most of you have heard, postulates that all of reality, everything that is, exists along these bands of undulating strings. So that something that, that is going on within a different dimension or a different intersection of time along these undulating strings may very well be affecting what you're experiencing, what I'm experiencing in the here and now. That's the, that's the gambit of, of string theory. And it's fascinating because Isaac Newton himself, uh, by the way, who was very deeply steeped in alchemy, something that I write about in um, modern occultism, Isaac Newton himself made the observation, uh, confounding observation that, there is a, a kind of mirror effect at work in our cosmos that not only particles, something that's been noticed within quantum theory, this is what Einstein referred to somewhat derisively as spooky action at a distance, not only do particles mirror each other, okay, uh, a particle, for example, um, that's, that's separated by vast distances from another seems to create a not yet understood pull on that object, but this occurs uh, uh, among macro objects as well, such as planetary bodies. The so-called mirror effect is, is confounding because we don't know its first causes. And there are, in fact, the guys who won the Nobel, um, uh, Nobel Prize um, uh, in physics just a, a couple of years ago, they were working with Bell's theorem, which is a way of trying to mathematically me measure this mirror effect. We're pretty good. We're pretty good at measuring it, but we're not very good at understanding why does this happen? Um, I mean, gravity is the same way. Gravity is essentially mass being attracted to itself. We're pretty good at measuring gravity. We're, we have no idea why it happens. We're really good at harnessing electricity. We have no idea why it happens. So you can start to see where this search for first causes gets into some enormously moving and, and enticing and exciting uh, material. And string theory, for example, is trying to account for the fact that this mirror effect exists. What's the first cause? Well, maybe these so-called undulating strings are a building block of reality, a composite of reality. The whole basis of string theory is that, um, in a sense, um, that Hugh Everett's many worlds theory is correct, that there are these different dimensions. This starts to sound a lot like the gambit of occultism. And I have no doubt that the occult inquiry, uh, which encompasses, uh, occupied the time and the energies and the attention of scientists from Giordano Bruno to um, Isaac Newton, the occult inquiry helped crack open some of these doors, helped us conceptualize some of these ideas. And I think it's hugely exciting. I, I believe there's a convergence of conversation occurring today between occultists like me, uh, between those of us who are interested in metaphysics, generally speaking, um, between those of us who are interested in the extra physical, whatever background we have, whatever fealties we claim, it's not important. But I think that those of us who are really deeply interested in the extra physical are entering into a conversation right now in the here and now with um, those who are deeply probing uh, the UFO thesis. And I believe that this, 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 this concept, this question of whether um, some of the most enticing UFO cases could be examined 
through the lens of interdimensionality, I think that's one of the most fascinating questions of our time. And it also begs the question of, well, look, we call something a poltergeist. We call something Bigfoot. We call something the Loch Ness Monster. We call something elves. We call something fairies. We call something, you name it, right? Maybe, maybe we call something E.T. We call something an alien. We call something the Greys, whatever. These are just words. These are just placeholders of reality, just like psychological terms like ego or superego, attachment, non-attachment, you know. These are just consensus-based placeholders of reality that we don't fully understand. Maybe all these aspects of the anomalous encyclopedia, the encyclopedia arcana, maybe all these things are momentary glimpses that we receive of events just as real as this one, that are going on in other intersections of time, which have their own beings, their own intelligence, their own needs, their own concerns. And maybe, maybe, maybe we intersect with these things once in a while. Maybe the uniquely gifted individual, or maybe just any individual, for reasons that we don't fully understand, intersects with these things sometimes. So it's exciting to be alive at this instant for all the harrowing things that are going on in our world for all the harrowing things that are going on uh, globally. We also have a chance, a wonderful, wonderful chance, I think in our own immediate era, to witness the convergence of all these inquiries. And I think it's fair to say that the occult query, the search for extra physicality outside of religious structures, limitations, doctrines, has helped bring us as, as modern people to the doorstep, the doorstep of probings and possibilities that may, in future generations, make all the terms that we use today uh, seem quaint and, and no longer necessary. A spirit, soul, ghost, poltergeist, uh, near-death experience, life after death, UFOs, UAPs, aliens. They're placeholders. They're placeholders, maybe, maybe, for, for extra physical experience. And extra physical experience itself may be interdimensional experience. And the beauty, it seems to me, of occultism is not only that it's helped crack open our minds to those ideas, but occultism is a, a rare philosophy that actually has hand in hand with it a practical uh, element. The individual wants to get somewhere. The individual wants to find his or her own practical ways of relating to um, this unseen world. And it seems to me that that is what occult philosophy has brought us to. So Mitch, we had a few questions come in about the Tarot. So I'd like to start there. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, can you say something about the link between Tarot and the Torah? Well, um, there's a brilliant uh, a theorist online. I'm, I'm forgetting his his Instagram account, but he does wonderful work um, in in a comparative study of tarot and Torah. Now, um, I'm watching his work very carefully, and I'm, I, I beg your pardon that I just can't remember the um, the account. I'm watching his work very carefully because I think he's a great scholar, and I really want to know what he has to say. To a very great extent, our connections of Torah and Tarot or Tarot and Kabbalah were um, introduced uh, by the um, uh, early Renaissance, um, early occult revivalist Eliphas uh, Levi. And um, there were references, there are, there, there exist earlier references, um, specifically in, in the work of uh, the Court of Jablin, um, that posit connections between uh tarot and Kabbalah. But a lot of that model and a lot of that methodology comes straight from the mid-19th century work of Eliphas Levi. Um, it doesn't exist per se within a Kabbalistic uh, works or tradition. However, I'm not going to become some sort of a um, um, calcified um, 
propagator of a position. Um, we're learning a lot of new things in our era. There are new astrological writings coming to light that have been written in, in Latin and Greece. Uh, people at Project Hindsight are doing a great job uh, dissecting some of this stuff. Um, we have the first great translations available to us today of hermetic literature, which had been neglected for many, many um, decades and centuries. We have um, uh, discoveries of Gnostic literature, including the Nag Hammadi uh, diaries that didn't become available to us until the end of the Second World War. So we're kind of going through a, a, a sort of petite renaissance in occultism right now. And I want to I, I want to follow the uh, comparative connections um, that some are drawing between uh, tarot and and Jewish tradition, the Hebrew language. I will say I'm 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 fairly convinced that that this emerges largely from the work of Elvis Levi, but I'm not so convinced that I, I don't want to give it a, a right and proper hearing. And I only apologize. I believe the, I was going to say, I only apologize. I don't remember the name. I think it's, it may be Torah Tarot, but it's on Instagram. Uh, next question. Going back to your initial comments on Tarot, uh, the questioner says he's interested in the matter of invented continuity to ancient times, mm -hmm. as is seen with Tarot and modern Rosicrucian movements, yeah. connecting themselves to Egypt. Right. Can you speak to this desire to connect more modern occultism to the past? Yes, and that's such a great question. First of all, um, the you know I was saying earlier that our religious situation here in the West is a schismatic situation. Uh, these ancient forms that animated the lives of our ancestors were brutally suppressed, and there was witch crazes and untold warfare and religious persecution. And I hardly need to go into all the different ways in which humanity destroys itself and divides itself up into these artificial communities and then punishes anybody who falls outside the gates of the community. It's very, very difficult in situations like that for religious retentions to survive. It's so brutal. It's so brutal. In fact, there was a big debate here in this country, the United States, as to whether hoodoo, the African-American magical tradition, uh, contained elements of West and Central African religion. And some sociologists in the early 20th century argued vociferously that the, the experience of slavery was just too brutal for the old forms to have survived. Nowadays, I think the position has grown more flexible. And in fact, I would say it's it's not only plausible but factual that there are West African traditions uh, in hoodoo. It's it's beyond question. I mean, we can go to the Museum of Natural History, and if they haven't shut down the wing yet because of one reason or another, um, you know, we can look at objects of devotion from Nigeria, for example, that that exist and populate a hoodoo tradition. So the ties are absolutely there. That said, the ties between current um, uh, spirituality, between occult spirituality and antiquity, I think they're really, really thin. They're really thin. Um, we are in a process of reclaiming this uh, spirituality. So, for example, Freemasonry tries to reclaim the initiatory uh, experience. Um, I am deeply interested in hermeticism. I'm trying to drink from those waters, which I know come from a very deep place. But it must be remembered that the hermetic texts that have reached us today, they've passed through so many different hands. We don't even have the originals anymore. You know, I was saying earlier that this Byzantine monk entered the court of the Florentine ruler Cosimo de' Medici with these mysterious manuscripts signed by Hermes Trismegistus. We don't even have those anymore. So when I talk about quality translations of the Hermetica, we're talking about source material that has been lost, has been rearranged, that um, has been translated by different people with their own point of view and their own agenda. And one of the dangers is we sometimes 
look back at ancient religious forms and we say, hey, that sounds just like this or just like that. And as Walter Honegraaff, a great scholar of esotericism, has argued, I think very rightly, be careful, be careful as soon as you start to identify those familiarities because the very fact that certain concepts are familiar to us may just be because out of um, fashion, out of um, cultural preference, there may be different translators and archivists who, you know, operating centuries ago, mistranslated something, left something out, uh, imbued something with a Christian context where no such context had existed before, you know, did things that just pleased um, please their sense of 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 rightness and 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 the 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 doctrine that they wanted to propagate. So it's really, really, really tough for us 21st century people to uh, connect in a really justifiable, traceable way to ancient traditions. But we have fragments. And as time passes, sometimes we gather more and more fragments. Look where Gnosticism was in the 20th century, early 20th century. You didn't hear the term Gnosticism all that often. It wasn't spoken of very much. In fact, when the term itself was coined in the 1700s, it was coined as a pejorative. And now, since the finding of some of the alternate gospels and other documents at the Nagamati Library, Gnosticism is a big part of people's search nowadays. I would argue that the first 20 minutes of the Barbie movie is one of the best explications of Gnosticism that's ever been offered to the general public. The idea that we live in this airsats world and something is not right here. Something is not right here. I think we all feel that. It's really difficult, though, to reconnect with our ancient Gnostic ancestors and to experience what they were going through and how desperate life must have felt day to day. You've got this, you know, you've got different armies and empires trying to regulate religious thought. You're getting burdened with excessive taxation. Your lifespan is very short. Um, you may be a Jew or a Christian, an early Christian who subscribes to a kind of apocalyptic worldview. Their lives were marked by a brutality that not many of us know today. It's hard to foster these connections. But I do view occultism, I do view occultism as a reconstructive um, movement, a movement of reconstruction, uh, reclaiming, and adaptation. And mind you, and I, I can't say this clearly enough, just because something is old doesn't mean it's true, and just because something is new doesn't mean it's frivolous. Uh, there is absolutely no reason to think that a theory or an idea, including tarot itself, uh, because it's demonstrated to come from a later place on the historical timeline than one might dramatically wish, doesn't mean that it's necessarily any less possessed of truth uh, than something that is demonstrably august and old. Um, and I believe new religious forms are profoundly important. Thank you. How does death relate to the multiple worlds theory? And why do we need a language like Tarot to perceive other timelines? Yeah, wonderful question. Um, one of the uh, things I've asked recently in writing and in speaking is, is magic necessary at all? Is any of this necessary? Are these all just devices, prayer, liturgy, tarot, um, I Ching, you know, you name it. Is any of this stuff actually necessary? If we realize, if we realize the extra physical capacities of our psyches. Well, William Blake spoke of uh, cleansing the doors of perception, cleansing the doors of perception, and then the individual can realize him or herself as 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 he or she truly is infinite. Well, maybe, maybe these devices help us to cleanse the doors of perception, but that's it. You know, they're devices. They're devices. Um, they're important and they're beautiful and they're aesthetically beautiful, and we may need them to cleanse these doors of perception. So I think they can help. Um, there is a um, wonderful a scholar at Wake Forest University, um, and I apologize because his name is escaping me, although I've quoted him, and he postulates, he's a professor of medicine at, at Wake Forest, 
um, Lanza, Robert Lanza, L-A-N-Z-A. He postulates, in fact, apropos of your question, that um, death is just conceptual. Death is just one thing that we experience. Einstein famously wrote in a letter, he was consoling somebody who had lost a relative. He said, look, you know, people like you and I who believe in physics know that death is illusory. And he wasn't just playing games. You know, he wasn't just playing games. Uh, Lanza argues, I think, in a really compelling way, that um, from if we're functioning from within the data of quantum mechanics and we're functioning from within some of the sturdiest ideas of quantum theory, it's entirely arguable that death, just like anything else, is just a localized experience that matches perception. And it's not the name of the game, that we're not bound by uh, linearity and we're not, well, we're not bound by the circumstances of the framework we live in, even though we may be conscripted to experience those circumstances. And those circumstances may be tragic. They may be cause for suffering and sorrow, but they're not ultimate reality. Now, people invested in religion would say, well, of course, you know, that we see that in scripture, whatever. But Lanza very elegantly uses a uh, quantum theory to argue pretty persuasively that death is just a perception. Well, thank you. Uh, this next question came in when you were talking about the uh, spread of Christianity and Islam around the world. Uh, were these new faiths actually popular or were they merely propagated as a political ideology, top down, suppressing the earlier faiths and making them subaltern and occult? Well, that's a fascinating question. That's a fascinating question. You know, it's it's important to realize that when we talk about the advent of new faiths, it's always tempting, of course, to think of this stuff in a very neat timeline. But like Christianity, it unfolded for centuries in myriad forms. Um, look, the Roman Emperor Constantine uh, around 330 or 332 A.D., uh, maybe getting those precise years wrong, but early in the 300s, Constantine is said to have converted to Christianity. Well, it's a little tricky <laughs> because he continued to engage in sun worship as well. And um, even on the steps of St. Peter's Basilica back in its earliest form, um, pilgrims would come to the steps and they would turn around and they would pay at a certain hour of the day, they would pay uh, homage to Sol Invictus, the sun god, or sometimes to Jupiter until one of the cardinals had to say, uh, look, folks, uh, we no longer do this. But so you had actual pilgrims, people who were, by every uh, definition, uh, early uh, Christians who belonged to the, the early church. But doctrine had not yet been fully codified. And they would, like Constantine, uh, continue to engage um, in sun worship uh, or worship of, of Jupiter, both of which were very popular movements at that particular time in the Roman Empire. And I don't often use the word pagan. I used it once during my talk. Again, I bow to generality. We have to speak in generalism sometimes to communicate with one another. But I'm not really fond of the term because it was really a derogatory term. Pagan means like villager or rural dweller. A pagan was considered somebody who lived in the boondocks. And the news of Christianity reached his or her ears belatedly. So you might call somebody a pagan who lived in one of the old villages who was still worshiping Jupiter, maybe into the five or six hundreds. So there was an admixture of beliefs in these faiths for a long, long time, centuries, uh, until practice and doctrine became fully codified and reached everybody. Look, the country that we today call Germany um, had outposts of pagan practice well into the 700s uh, AD. Germany, in fact, was really the last country to be Christianized in Western Europe. So these retentions then, of course, got folded into folk practice. They got folded into Christianity. Um, uh, Sawain you know, lingers in popularity, the ancient the Celtic uh, ancestral worship uh, um, uh, season. And so it becomes 
uh, All Saints Day or All Hallows Eve, you know, our Halloween. This happens all the time where religions enfold and subvert uh, ancient ideas, suit them to their own calendar and and practices. I also have to say, though, and and I think this is this is something that must be said in favor of Christianity. Look, um, it's only very recent that any uh, most people have attained literacy, have been able to read. So it's not as if ancient men and women were <laughs> encountering gospels or anything in written form. They Renaissance era, late Renaissance era, men and women, you know, probably couldn't even read the King James Bible. So it's not like this stuff was available to people, but the message, the message that there's this one monotheistic creator and that uh, uh, this creator is reachable just through the individual opening his heart, forgives everything. Um, you don't got to come from a priestly class. You don't have to make big expensive sacrifices. You're not going to get taxed. I think that there was significant enough erosion of some of the temple systems and, and orders in the Western world so that when the Christian message uh, began to spread, leaving aside all the brutality and the forced conversion and the warfare and the Inquisition, it's just part of the human story. It's part of the human story, sadly, and it occurs everywhere. But philosophically, philosophically, I can understand I can understand how ancient men and women must have felt like this was this cool, refreshing drink of water. They had witnessed priestly systems, temple systems that were corrupt, that were abusive of the individual, that were tied in with the government, that were tied in with occupying armies, that taxed the hell out of them, that were irritating, that made life very, very difficult. Uh, that had kind of like a winner-take-all mentality, and then suddenly you're being told, the meek shall inherit the earth, blessed are the poor in spirit. It must have felt just, just tremendously revolutionary for many of these people. So there's that too, and that has to be said. Uh, you mentioned Jacob Needleman. What influence did Jacob Needleman have on your philosophy of life, and did he ever talk about occult subjects? Oh, sure. Um Jerry uh, was a friend um, and somebody who I published in my past life was in publishing, published Jerry for many years. Um, Jerry was very deeply active within the Gurdjieff work, uh, the system brought by the um, spiritual philosopher and teacher G.I. Gurdjieff. And uh, Gurdjieff's ideas um, are just extraordinary. If you really permit them or can find a way to allow them to penetrate. They're just extraordinary. And they dispel illusions that we walk around about, whether we walk around with about ourselves, specifically that um, we're some sort of free actors who are going about things in a self-directed way. Gurdjieff's analysis was that humanity is asleep. And he meant this in the most literal sense, not metaphorically, that we are sleepwalking, that we are just automatized beings, very reactive, not really possessed of a unified center. And um, this was Jerry's dedication. And uh, this is a, a way of thought that is at the center of my outlook as well. And I think... This is what I found so extraordinary about Jerry. Um, he believed very deeply in human possibility, very deeply in human possibility. But he also believed that we as individuals and as a human species are in much, much worse condition than we think, every single one of us. And people like to say, um, oh, why is there all this war? Why is there all this insanity in the world? Why are people doing these cruel things to one another? Well, you know, look at a mirror. Look at a mirror. I mean, war doesn't touch my life in a very direct way um, just because of accident, happy accident. I was born in the United States. I've been at the right place at the right time where a flower pot hasn't fallen on my head. But I, I, I don't have anything to do with that. I don't have anything to do with that. I'm speaking to you tonight 
on a new computer that I bought that has a, a battery in it that has mercury in it at some point, even though I know I'm not supposed to, I'm going to dispose of this computer. That battery is going to wind up in a landfill that's in some kid's backyard in the Philippines, and I'm messing up his drinking water. You know, and this is just talk about the macro stuff. I mean, the micro stuff, the intimate stuff is horrible. The things we do to one another, the subtle insults, the put downs, the cruelty. And we're all part of it. So I never, I mean, to say why is there war going on is to almost avert one's gaze from oneself. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm not doing justice to how grave that situation is. Jerry was able to, to, I think he was able to hold on to this, this yin yang, this paradox of the human situation where we are in really, really bad shape. And yet we have possibilities that are greater than we've ever imagined. And um, I believe that's true. And he inculcated me with that belief. So, these are the kinds of things that I uh, I learned from him. Um, I learned something else, and I'm just going to share this as a little morsel. Some of you may have seen this reference somewhere in something I've written. Jerry once said to me, um, what do you do when someone offers you a gift? And I just stared at him blankly, and he said, you accept it. You accept it. Now, I want you to think about that in your own life. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, this next question is about the Brotherhood of Light. What are your thoughts on Albert Benjamin or C.C. Zane? I write about him extensively in um, Occult America, my first book, and to a lesser extent, um, more briefly, in Modern Occultism. Albert Benjamin or C.C. Zane was an American occultist who, in the 1930s, uh, created what he called the religion of the stars, which he believed was a cosmically informed, universalistic, deeply humane faith based in astrology. And I think he was a beautiful, beautiful man. And I respect and I love him. I do believe that Zane's um, marrying of tarot uh, to uh, ancient Egypt is very deeply uh, fanciful and something that he uh, inherited or borrowed from a French uh, occult theorist. Uh, I believe his name is uh, uh, Paul Christensen. And Zane, who was a lovely man, I think was uh, overly ingenuous in applying uh, this, this theoretical connection between tarot and the wisdom of ancient Egypt. I think that's entirely fanciful. But I do think he was a lovely man, and I would say that every religion, every religion without exception, contains parables and stories and ideas that are deeply fanciful. Sometimes we're just able to unmask them more quickly in modern times just because we have greater access to information. doesn't mean that what C.C. Zane was doing was any greater or lesser than what someone in antiquity was doing. It's just that we can't we can't find the threads of connection and, and sort things out quite as well. But every religion begins with miraculous claims. So I don't fault him for any of that stuff. And I think he was a lovely man. And um, let me tell you, there were some figures in the 1930s who were into occultism in this country, in the United States, who weren't so lovely. <laughs> and, um, and, and Zane was one of the good guys. Well, Mitch, we're past our time. Can we take a couple more questions before we finish up? Sounds good. Okay. You mentioned you're a lone wolf. Do you think you would ever decide at some point to join a group like the Freemasons or the Rosicrucians? Well, uh, sure. You know, I, I I have friends within Freemasonry. I, I'm a friend to Freemasonry. Um, and I have been asked to join lodges. I have not uh, up to this point. A lot of people think I'm a Freemason. I'm not a Freemason. Um, but there's no principle involved in my not joining. It's just a matter of time. Um, I have uh, two kids. I have a household to maintain. I have my own work to do. You know, I'm rather hyper and I get a lot done, but I, I don't want to just be a paper member. I want to really contribute something. So uh, I have not yet joined um, Masonry or any other group aside from the Theosophical Society. Um, and um, I, 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 I'm willing for that to change at any time. You know, lone wolf today running with the pack tomorrow. Yeah, it's fine. All right. Thank you. 
And uh, to finish up, we had a couple questions. A couple of people wanted to know. You mentioned at the beginning of the program about the uh, decision you had to make with the difficult job. Uh, yeah. Which job are you going to take? Oh, well, it's two different jobs. And I promise you, uh, in the future, I'll be disclosing about this. I'll tell you the whole thing. But right now, it's just playing out. So I have to be more private. But the tarot incident occurred exactly as I related it. <laughs> <laughs> 